Please welcome Christine Vachon. Hello. <laughs> so you forgot Carol. I forgot Carol. I did not because I have an extra slide with all the films that you did with Todd Haynes together. I, I forgot to talk about Todd Haynes in general because the first film, um, I wanted to build a little bridge to the Teddies actually because you were being given an, an honorary award and also you were given one of the first Teddies for, for Poison um, after, actually starting with Poison you produced everything with Todd Haynes together that you also studied with Safe, I think many of us love, Velvet Goldmine. Far From Heaven, I'm Not There, Mildred Pierce, the miniseries, and then of course Carol that I want to talk about in detail with you later. But now maybe let's bring the Teddy and you together. 1991 was the year Poison won, 1992 was the year that Swoon, I think, had a guest award, Go Fish, of course, 1994, and then Hedwig and the Angry Inch is a film that was in the, in the realms of the um, Teddy Jubilee that Wieland and Michael Stitz uh, organized, a retrospective of Teddy of queer relevant films, the one that you picked, that's going to screen tomorrow at the Kino International and that Christine Vachon is also going to introduce. Um, I've been thinking and researching a little bit about the Teddy Awards and um, Wieland has been talking a lot about how it all started. It was um, not an award, but it was actually a teddy that was bought by Manfred Salzke and Wieland Speck in a, in a store. It was held in a infamous punk club in Kreuzberg called SO36. I imagine it to be really a little bit messy, a little bit chaotic. Over the years, this teddy award has become an institution. It's become institutionalized, professionalized, and last year was even held in, a, in an opera house. And my first question is like, um, what do we think of this? Do we, um, was it better when we were still a little bit messy, when the, the entire queer scene and the queer film scene was a little bit more chaotic, when things were not as much institutionalized? Or is that exactly, you know, talking also about the films, you know, Poison is also um, a classic by now. Um, is it a good development that we and the Teddy Award um, developed into something that can sort of compete with the ma mainstream? Also keeping in mind that the Berlinale alone is giving out 35 awards every year. Well, you know, I'm not much for nostalgia, so I, I don't really like to, th you know, I don't like to look backwards that much. I think what I think is pretty amazing is that 30 years ago, the Teddy existed, and when we got to Berlin with Poison and we were told, oh, you know, there's this award you could win, we were like, for a gay movie? Like in a film festival that isn't known as a gay film festival. That felt really revolutionary at the time, you know, and, and that was extraordinary. So, I don't know, look, I, 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 live in a, I live in New York City where it's become like a pastime to talk about how much better everything used to be. So, <laughs> I'm not really interested in that because I think it's pretty, I, I think we're doing some pretty awesome things right now. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the impact you just said it. Um, there was a big surprise that there was even a gay award, something that, you know, maybe other generations now being used to a multitude of queer film festivals right. around the world are just like taken for granted. Um, was there actually an impact, I wonder, like looking back, but also, you know, looking at Hedwig is not so much looking back. Does winning a Teddy actually mean, and you're the, one of the, or even the queer film producer, although you don't like the title too much, um, does that have an impact apart from the queer bubble that we are all making films in? I mean, I, I think so. I think it has a, it, it, de it definitely has a distinction, you know? Um, and part of its distinction is that it's a, an award in a, in, a, in a festival that has you know, a lot of cultural currency. Do you, um, if we look at the Teddy, you just said it's something special about the Berlinale. We don't have an extra queer film festival, but it's part of all sections. It's called, sort of like the Teddy is kind of like queering the Berlinale in the sense that it could be a children's film, it could be from the Forum, it could be from the Panorama. Is there, would you say there's a, there's a difference? Is that, is that um, sort of like a better or worse solution to like having a queer festival where only queer people meet in that sense? Or? God, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's funny. Uh, our movie Goat, which is playing here um, at that shows tonight, 
uh, that takes place in a fraternity um, with Nick Jonas and Ben Schnetzer. Somebody said to me, one person said to me, well, it's too bad you don't have a film competing for the Teddies this year. And the other person, which was Marcus Who, by the way, said, are you kidding? Goat's the gayest movie here. <laughs> so it is kind of interesting how, we ne I mean, I think it was kind of easy in 1991 and 1992 to say, like, that's a queer movie, because it's so, it's so, so clear, the storyline, the, you know, the subject matter, et cetera, have to be, have to set themselves apart. Now it's not so easy, you know? Is it just about the director? Is it about the story? Is it about its provenance? It's really, I think it's kind of hard to say. <laughs> Talking about labels, um, in, in, in one of your books, I think it was Shooting to Kill, you, you start with, well, I had in mind, like, how would I introduce you? And I came up with this great term, Queen of Queer Cinema. And then on page five, you say, but I also get called Queen, queen of the Queer Cinema all the time, and I hate it. So maybe you can, you can tell us a little bit about um, the labeling that you like and the labeling that you don't like for yourself. Well, okay, I, I recommend to everybody, don't write a book in 1998. <laughs> Because in 2016, people will quote it at you. And you'll be like, what did I, what? Um, so, okay. Uh, you know, look, I, I think at that time, I was reacting to, you know, to the box that I was being put in. And I was trying to make movies. I've always made movies that I love, and I've always made movies um, Uh, that I'm passionate about. That's all that Killer has ever done. Um, and some of them are very queer and some of them are not. Some of them I would say are and a queer audience might say they aren't. You know, I am who I am. I follow my own sensibility. At the time, I think I was probably chafing a little bit against the idea that I was only supposed to make one kind of film. And that there was actually pressure You know, there has been pressure from the queer community from the moment I started making films that was often not positive. I mean, you know, at, in, those, in the early 90s when we were dealing with the AIDS crisis, there was a lot of pressure on anybody making any kind of queer content. Uh, there was this whole notion of positive imaging. And, uh, and if you made a film that was considered not positive, um, which Poison was not considered particularly positive, but Swoon was really considered not positive. Um, then, you know, that was, you know, people, you know, I got, I got, luckily there was an email then, or I would have gotten hate email, but I got a lot of hate mail, you know, from people from my so-called community, saying, you, you're, you're letting us down, you're doing everyone a disservice. So I was probably responding to a lot of that when I, when I said, now I'm happy to be the queen of anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, I'm, I'm happy. Um, maybe, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, you, you started talking about, when you talk, started talking about Poison, I think it was the, the one film by, by Todd Hans you didn't produce as the um, superstar, the Karen Carpenter story that you saw. For those of you who don't know it, it's a, um, Well, the, the story of the singer um, Karen Carpenter, a film that is now not banned, but that is not, you know... You can illegally download it on YouTube. They take it down all the time, but it almost always goes back up, so just look for it. There, there is a, I watched it yesterday on Vimeo, so it's out there. I didn't know if you were involved in this, so I didn't want to mention it. Okay, good, you can all watch it. It's um, funny and amazing, and it, instead of actors, it has Barbie dolls and tells the story. And you saw that and said, well, that's a kind of... I think you used the words like, fresh and uh, original cinema that you, you wanted to make, and then you made a film, Poison, that is basically three films that are connected with each other, and then you made Swoon, which is, you know, you just said it, um, about, it's the same story that Hitchcock used for Rope in a way, it's about these two killers who were lovers, and um, that Vito Russo in the celluloid closet, of course, you know, um, put under the, the bad gay label, of course, you know, that, that's I think where the, where the voices come from. Like for such a long time there was only negative representation, it was all, the entire debate was just about how are we represented, why are we the evil lesbians who have to die, why are we the killers, and all of a sudden there's Tom Kalen. Right, but that also supposes that there's one gay positive image for everybody. I mean, you know, and, and obviously that's not true either. You know, 
Um, I remember when Longtime Companion came out. Now I look at that movie and I have to say, I really admire it and I, I find it incredibly moving. When it came out, I didn't feel like it spoke to me. I thought it was about a bunch of like older, rich, gay men. And I was like, that's supposed to be our positive image? That has nothing to do with me, you know? So, um, and that was a movie that was very praised at the time. It's like, all right, this is, this is showing, you know, what, we're showing the straight community that we're just like them? So, so that was, that, those were the battles that were happening then. You know, it was marginalizing a lot of people in the queer community who weren't white, who weren't rich, you know, who weren't male. And that was, you know, um, I didn't want to make those movies. I wanted to make kind of fucked up movies. How was the response when you when you um, presented Poison? What, were you were you there for the presentation of Poison Swoon back then in Berlin? Here in Berlin? Yeah, absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit about how that was? I, so I'm supposed to remember 1991. <laughs> uh, Talking about nostalgia, um, I'm curious, you know. Uh, I I I think you know. Look, uh, Poison was, Berlin was my first international film festival. We come straight from Sundance, where we won the grand jury prize. And just as an aside, Poison was my first film. We won the grand jury prize at Sundance. I was like, how hard can this be? <laughs> I have brought about 40 movies to Sundance, and I've never won a damn thing again. So anyway, uh, so we came right from, from uh, Sundance uh, to Berlin. And um, yeah, it was uh, it was kind of you know it was a very extraordinary experience. It seems old hat now because I've done it a lot. But to show a movie to people from a lot of different cultures and um, and to see their response to it, which I I believe was pretty positive, if I remember correctly. Um, villains nodding, so it, it must have been. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it was quite an experience. You know, it was, um, it, it, and then Swoon, um, Swoon was the movie that was really the lightning rod for the positive, not positive image and, you know, which, so it divided people a little bit more. Of course, here in Berlin, it divided people saying like, ugh, Americans. <laughs> like they get so caught up in these things. We just like the story. And then other people saying, You're, you are really doing a disservice to your community. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, the financing of that. We don't already talked about the, the different systems and the different system in Germany, that there is a finance system that you could also very much argue about. Ms. Rosenfeld already made a comment about this in the last panel. But um, tell us about how you produce as a first time producer or first time feature producer for a then very unknown director, um, a threefold feature film consisting of three different stories shot in three different genres and believe in it still. See, I wonder about the relevancy of that now because it was so long ago okay. that the way I financed that movie wasn't how I would do it now. I mean, at the time, um, there was a there was v v systems of of investment in film which don't really exist anymore, um, uh, and you know a lot of the investors in Poison, frankly, have the same last name as the director. Um, but uh, but now we're you know such a different you know now it's all about it's about cast it's about foreign sales it's about. Um, It's about really understanding, as a filmmaker, what the um, what your film's worth is in the marketplace and why, and that's really what we're grappling with every day. I look at the you know at the early '90s as like the good old days because cast wasn't so critical. We could cast who we wanted. Now it's all about cast for us. You know, for better or worse. Sometimes that's. I mean, I'm not complaining about putting, you know, somebody like Julianne Moore in Still Alice. I mean, that's a wonderful marriage of fantastic part for the perfect actress that got the best possible result, you know. Um, but it has, you know, the film financing itself has really changed for us in the States. 
And I'm, I'm curious what the, I didn't want to just talk about the past, but I'm curious about these turning points exactly, because like, you know, also if we talk about film availability, now our generation, you know, can just put in the words into Google and find everything online, you know, like the cinema as a space of community and, you know, relevance, of, of, of cultural relevance was different, there was, a VHS was already there, but you know, this entire thing like is, is what you, like from, from starting to now, we're going through, and I mean, you already talked about this, when, when would you say were, were the turn, turning points, or what, what were the turning points, like in this development, that in the beginning was kind of like you, you alluded to it, like a family funded endeavor, and now? Well, I, I mean, one of the interesting things I think about the beginning, of you know what's what's called you know uh, new queer cinema in the early 90s is um, as a producer we really had a captive audience because uh, if you were queer and you heard that there was a movie that had any kind of gay and lesbian content whatsoever you went to see it because there was so little and people were so desperate to see themselves represented on screen and Poison's a good example because Poison is at its heart an extremely experimental film. So, um, you know, people showed up, broke records at the Angelica Film Theater that were held until only a few years ago. Um, uh, you know, people showed up in droves to see the movie, but of course, they weren't expecting to see something so experimental. And I remember standing outside the theater and all these people coming out going, what? You know, like, I thought I was gonna see some boys kissing. What was all that, you know? So, but it was really, you know, people would go see what there was. So if you could figure out how to make a movie uh, for the right budget, meaning a budget that really just made the assumption that only the gay and lesbian audience would go see it, you could make a film that was financially successful. You know, and that was a very empowering thing. That is, of course, that's not the way it is now, exactly. There's elements of that, but now everybody has, you know, essentially the history of cinema at their fingertips. So, you know, if Poison came out today, it would be not just competing against the other queer films, it would be competing against, you know, Fassbinder and, and you know, whatever else you can get on Netflix and competing against you, know, you as a consumer deciding how you were going to spend your Saturday night. I, I was just thinking as you were talking if a film like Poison would be made today, I mean also if we look at um, Todd Haynes' filmography, I mean it is the, the, the starting point and then came Safe which is in its structure and its narration not so experimental but also like a really you know positively weird film and then you know, you can say something about all these films, most of you will know them, but, um, you know, would, would, he, would he get the money now to make a film like Poison? Well, I mean, you know, I get asked that question a lot. If it's not Poison, it's another movie. Uh, and I guess, I guess that's not, I'm not quite sure what the answer to that is, besides of like, no, of course not. You know, it's, but I think it's more like there's so many different platforms. He might have decided to make it as a web series you know, or to make it for YouTube, or make it as, you know, absolutely, you know, the thing about Poison was, it was absolutely and completely Todd's vision. He really didn't have to compromise at all. Not, you know, not on cast, not on content, nothing. Those movies, those, that content is still happening. It just isn't always happening in the movies. So I think that's really what we, what we have to think about, you know? That it's not, you know, a theatrical motion picture filmmaking. I love it, I do a lot of it, but it's not the be all and end all. Maybe b before we talk a little bit about um, Carol, you know, we have one very early film, or actually your first film, and then of course we have Hedwig that is going to screen tomorrow and that wasn't screened in Germany ever after Wieland invited the film and it was never released in Germany also because it was bought by a major company that decided not to ever release it here. And um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, that and why you actually picked it because you had a carte blanche for the film that you wanted to, 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 to show and maybe you can tell us a little bit about it. All right, well, I wasn't here when Hedwig showed in, um, at the Berlinale. I was at Sundance, and then for whatever reason, I couldn't, I couldn't make it here. 
and I was heartbroken because because you can you imagine a better festival for the film? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, you know, Hedwig was, and actually, you know, just as an aside, uh, I was in Miami right before I got here, and I, some of you know, I, I I'm on Twitter a lot, so I tweeted. I'm in Miami for one night for a retrospective of Todd Haynes' work, and who emailed me within two minutes was John Cameron Mitchell. He said, I'm in Miami too. So we ended up spending the evening together, and uh, which was just perfect right before I came. And suddenly in the middle of the, e of the evening, I said, hey, you know I'm showing Hedwig, right? In Berlin, he's like, I do, I, I do know. He's like, you missed it the last time. <laughs> and, uh, um, and it was just, you know, I mean, Hedwig is one of those, like, I don't know, I think it's, I, I, there's been a revival of the musical on Broadway, um, and I went to see it, it was great to see it. I still think the movie's better, because the movie has so much more nuance, and, and I, um, I hope you're all planning to see it, because it is such a treat to see with an audience. And it just felt like it's kind of celebratory, and it felt like the right thing to show as part of the as part of a celebration for the Teddies. Does it just look? It was like one of the biggest films you produced so far, or was it actually also budget-wise? Because like you know, it's it's a musical. It has a lot of production values. You know, the costumes and everything. I think I, I, think I made Velvet Goldmine before Hedwig, didn't I? Oh yeah, right, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. You know, I don't really clock them that way. Mm -hmm. Like that was bigger. This was less, etc. It's more like. You know, it's more about their challenges. The challenge on Hedwig was that the director was in hair and makeup for three hours every day. You know? So that was a challenge. Uh, and the actors were all like, where, you know, where's my director? And I was like, that's him. There he is. You know, and uh, um, so that was, that was tough. And I think it was one of those things um, with Hedwig that we, uh, if, if we were a little bit more experienced, we would have thought it was just too crazy to try and make it, you know, with, with John directing. But of course, who else could have directed it? And who else could have played Hedwig? So, you know, it was just one of those things. So it's tomorrow at 8 at the Kino International, which I also find a really good place because it's in East Berlin and Hedwig is also divided by Absolutely. not only the wrong sex, but also the wrong side of the wall. And now, um, <clears throat> finally, maybe we can talk about Carol before you join in, and maybe you already have some questions, but then let's do it afterwards. It seems like... Um, I've not seen these Carol posters. These are alternative Carol posters from IndieWire. Do, oh, okay. do you approve of them? I'm not sure. <laughs> Kate's not on that one at all, right? Uh, no, it's only... Okay, all right. Uh, <laughs> we sort of work together in a funny way, right? It's, it's like Kate's looking at her. It's true, yeah. Then she's kind of at the bottom. I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> From all the films you produce, it's the one with the most nominations or wins. Like, if we can trust the IMDb, it has 181 nominations so far. It won 47 awards so far. I was nominated for nine BAFTAs, but also like got none. It's nominated for six Oscar nominee uh, for six. And we'll get none. Um, <laughs> also, also was snubbed because it's not nominated for best picture or for best director. And um, maybe we can talk about this a little bit, you know, because it looks like your biggest sort of like success, if I use it in my very non-producer naivete, um, you know, that it's like the biggest thing so far. You open up in Cannes, Rooney Mara got um, the Golden Palm in Cannes, and so on and so forth. And now, from a distance, it looks like the biggest success, and you just made the joke yourself, like it will not win. Like maybe you can go a little bit about this. Well, I can't. I can't really sit up here and complain about getting six Oscar nominations. You know what I mean? So I'm not going to do that. And uh, look, there's been a lot of discussion about the lack of diversity this year in the Oscars. And, uh, and, and you know, this discussion kind of started in some ways back at Cannes 
when there was, you know, all the information started to come out specifically about women, uh, how little, how few movies they directed, and and um, uh, and, I, and when we got to Cannes, it was the year of the woman. It's the year of the woman. And uh, Kate Blanchett was like, "Is that all we get? A year?" And uh, and that was, you know, I was like, "Yeah, you know." And then it sort of began this discussion of like. There is, you know, there's no women, there's no people of color, what are we gonna do? And, um, and on one hand, you know, of course it feels like those kind of discussions are always like, you have them and you think you've done something, but actually you haven't. You've had a discussion. That's all you've done. On the other hand, I felt like at least that transparency was forcing companies, institutions, to look a little bit more within and to, and, and to be a little bit more accountable. I'm not saying it solves the problem at all. But I do feel like with the, with the Oscars, somebody said, I can't remember who, said, you know, the problem, prob you shouldn't begin the discussion at the nominations. The discussion has to begin way before, like what are the movies that are getting greenlit? Who's working on them? What are these stories? Who's casting them? Who's directing them? And, um, and so I'm not, I don't want to appropriate, you know, the, the discussion about, you know, the, you know, hashtag Oscars so white to uh, hashtag Oscars so straight. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the, I, again, we got six nominations. I'm not gonna complain about that. Um, why didn't we get more? Why are the movies, you know, notably, you know, Chirac or Straight Outta Compton or films that are, you know, a black driven um, that got nothing, you know? Um, Creed, of course. Uh, um, you know, again, is it because the Academy is, what is it, 94%? White, I think, is what I read, you know, um, and uh, of that, 84% male, you know. Again, that's and you know, I do feel like the head, of, you know, Cheryl Blue Isaacs is really she's trying, she's trying to figure out how to make the Academy look more like the people who are actually working on the movies, and the people, who, those of us who are actually working on the movies. We've got a lot to answer for, too. I mean, we've got, you know, look, I think Killer has a good record, but our record could be better. Our record could always be better, you know? So, and it's all about, you know, it, ultimately it's, it's about inclusiveness and who you let into the room, who you let into the table, on, you know, to the table. And, and um, so, so that's a long-winded way of saying, I'm not going to complain <laughs> about six Oscar nominations. And, uh, you know, I'm a human being. I'm not going to say, you know, would I have liked a best picture? Of course. But that's not how it turned out this way. And we're making a whole bunch of new movies. Which is great. And, but I also still wonder, I mean, you know, these discourses are mostly not dominated by the people who are actually making the films, but by the media, and then there's this trend, and then there's this trend, and then we had Brokeback Mountain, and then we had The Kids Are Alright, and then this year we have Carol and the Danish Girl, and everything is fine. Um, do you still think, from a producer's point of view, that um, this is a very sort of important development considering the last, say, 20 years, that it was easier to market female-driven stories, that it was actually, that it is easier to not just have a niche and a limited release for a film like Poison, but to get Carol into more cinemas, to have more international sales, and that this actually is progress, or is there something that I'm not seeing? Well, I mean, female-driven stories, whether they're gay or straight or black or Latino or whatever, are tough. They are hard, they're, the, they're amongst the hardest, you know? And when you're trying to finance a female-driven story, 90% um, of the time you're being asked, well, who's the guy? You know, like, was still Alice, was, you know, the casting was a lot about the guy. And we used to say, it's not called Still Alice and John, it's just called Still Alice, unfortunately. 
Uh, so, you know, and the guys are like, well, I'm not sure I want to be in it if it's just called, you know, if it's just about her. So, um, so that's an issue. I mean, that comes down to like, you know, film financing itself. I mean, look, Carol has two bona fide movie stars in it. And that is a big part of how it got financed. Um, and I don't know if I can say, you know, and it's a fairly, uh, on the surface, it's a wonderful universal love story. I guess the difference is, unlike Brokeback Mountain, for example, is they don't have to pay for the fact that they want to be together. Well, they do. They do. I mean, uh, Carol has to give up her child, but she makes that decision that she wants to be true to herself. And you, and, you know, uh, the one question I get asked about Carol all the time is, do you think they made it? <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I'm like, I think they gave it a shot. <laughs> and sometimes that's the best you can hope for, you know? So, so, you know, I mean, and I don't want to criticize, look, I loved Brokeback Mountain, and I really love The Kids Are All Right, too. I don't, you know, I'm not, I, I don't, I understand some people say, yeah, but the kids are all right. It all got, you know, got taken over by the guy. And I get that, but that was that specific story. Um, and, uh, and I do, you know, I think that, I don't know, you know, look, I, I still keep coming back to the same thing with Carol. It, I, I'm, it's a miracle of a movie. I love it. I think Todd, it was at his, at his creative height. And I don't want the film to be defined by what it didn't do. A little uh, run through the work of uh, Christine is sort of like concluded with Carol here. I want to open it up now. I'm sure you want to use the opportunity to ask a couple of questions yourself. We had sort of like open it up, I hope with the films that we were showing, Liz Rosenfeld is waiting again. Can we get her a mic, or am I supposed to bring her a mic? I don't think so, no. Sorry, I know I spoke earlier, but I had to take this opportunity because, Ms. Michonne, I have to say, as a filmmaker who has, really, I'm a fan, to be honest, um, Todd Haynes is somebody who uh, many of fellow queer filmmakers have followed their, you know, whole lives and has seen as a huge inspiration and particularly for me, what's amazing about the work you guys have done is that there seems to still be this element of experimentation that has flo like flowed through his film work as well as has been flowing in tandem with him becoming, I would say, moving more and more into the mainstream, let's say, right? Um, working with Hollywood actors, being embraced by HBO, for example. Um, and I'm curious how that works from coming from an experimental place as a filmmaker, what that was like as a journey, I suppose, also particularly as his producer. Um, well, I, you know, I guess it was pretty organic. I mean, you know, uh, as, as his, as he started, you know, as he started figuring out the kinds of stories he wanted to tell, and we started figuring out together how we were going to get them made, and this, you know, kind of um, happened at a time where cast became more critical, and then his ability to, I mean, his ability to attract cast became you know, stronger. I mean, I'm not there is a good example because I'm not there is wildly experimental. Um, and Todd knew the only way he was going to get it done was to cast that level of cast. You know, like Richard Gere and Kate Blanchett and Heath Ledger. Um, so he had a very good understanding of that, how that, how that plays. I don't feel like there was a moment where we where there was some giant transition for us. Like when we worked with Ju Julianne Moore on Safe, 
she was a relatively unknown at the time. So it wasn't like we went from, you know, nobody's on poison to like Meryl Streep. I mean, she was, you know, she was, uh, she was just coming into her career too. So we sort of grew up with it in a, to a certain degree, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I was just curious. I just find that that it really, particularly, I'm not there, I mean, that was the, I'm not there, that was a particularly impressive example of, you know, what I would consider kind of this like queer avant-garde perspective merging with a more mainstream um, economy of filmmaking and um, just very interested in how that, you know, the hurdles of that are going to I mean, that. look, the hurdles with any Todd Haynes film and most of our films are the ambitions always almost always far outweigh the resources. And um, so it's a constant, you know, uh, challenge to figure out how to, you know, make those meet. And, um, you know, I'm Not There was no exception. Uh, I mean, there was a sense on I'm Not There sometimes of like, wow, do the financiers know like how off the wall this is? But, um, but usually we try and make sure that they do know because, you know, we all, have, you know, if you're not, if we're not all making the same movie, there's gonna be a price to pay somewhere down the line. So, um, but again, you know, the, it was shored up by the fact that we had those extraordinary actors. <laughs> who were willing to compromise their, their fees, I guess, right? Oh, they compromised those fees, yes. <laughs> they did, if that's what you want to call it. No, I, yes. I'm, my, I'm not yes. a native speaker, so that's but. possibly not how you would say it, but you know, um, how, how difficult was that? Like, how, how much of, an, you know, of a family thing was that be, between Kate Blanchett, Todd Haynes, and you, for example? Like, right, would... but I mean, but it's easy to a certain degree. I mean, Todd Haynes has, you know, he's sort of in a, He's in a, in a class by himself to some degree because he has such an extraordinary record. And um, when I call agents to get their actors in his movies, they, they usually say yes before I've even told them what the script is about. It's what's a hundred times harder are the movies I make with the first time directors, you know, who are um, first or second time, who are, you know, telling or, or Filmmakers who are making their first English language movies, um, which we also do, you know, uh, and where I have to convince the agent that their film, that their their actor should sit down with this director, that this is a story worth telling, that this is something that they should be, you know, creatively excited about. Those are the tougher ones. Like getting actors into Todd's movies is like, you know, boom, boom, boom. Hello, Todd Haynes film. Thank you. Bye. That's it. <laughs> That's it. But that's a small part of what we do. It's, I mean, it's not a small part, it's a big part. But, you know, we make a lot, like, we make a lot of first-time filmmakers' movies, or, you know, we just made a movie with Andrew Desanmu, who made an extraordinary film called Mother of George. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a bigger film for him. Mother of George was a, you know, true international, you know, recognized film. And I find myself explaining to every damn agent who the hell he is when they should know, you know, because he's such a good filmmaker. That's the challenge. There's a question in the back. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I just wanted to ask about your collaboration with the writer Hilton Owls. And uh, I, I saw with your film Swoon, uh, there was a credit uh, for Hilton Owls on that film. Is this True Whoever, not? Whoever's talking, raise your hand because I can't see you. Oh, there you are. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, yes, we collaborated. Tom brought Hilton uh, to Swoon, and, um, and th that script was a true collaboration between the two of them. Hilton has, as you know, I'm sure, has written a number of books. He and I tried to, we, there was a film script he wrote about Orson Welles and his relationship with Billie Holiday um, that we experimented with, you know, trying to get to the screen that didn't work out. Um, but, you know, as, you know, I mean, he's an extraordinary writer. 
So who knows? Um, yeah, I just also wanted to know how much of it influenced your work or not. Like, is it, was it all, I mean, how much of it influenced you and your process and, and vice versa and how much of you influenced him? Because um, I know his work and I know he's a very strong writer, as you pointed out. But how, what was that process like? The, On Swoon? Again, we're going back a long time. Um, you know, I mean, I guess the thing was, on Swoon, everybody was very young. You know, Hilton's now, you know, a, 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 a revered published author who's, you know, writes for The New Yorker, and, you know, he's, he's you know, a giant in his field. 20 years ago, he was, you know, starting out and writing stuff and experimenting, as was Tom Kalen. So we were kind of all experimenting together. I guess I'm trying to say like, like it was, uh, I can't remember who brought who into the story, because I came to it later. When I came to Swoon, Hilton and Tom had already begun their collaboration. So I don't know who invited who. You know what I mean? Um, uh, and maybe I knew at one time, but I certainly can't remember now. But what I walked into was a really interesting, invigorating collaboration between two people at the very beginning of their careers. We have time for one more question. Does anyone want to raise their hands? There is one coming down. Christine, your oeuvre is awesome. I'd like to ask you about... <laughs> a film that I could imagine was the most difficult to pull off because of content, and it was by Tom, and it was Savage Grace which is an extraordinary film. And I know Tom, and I've never found an occasion to ask him, but you as, a, as the producer, I don't think there's hardly any film that I can think of that is more uh, frightening, verboten, everything. It is a work of art, it is beautiful, beautiful film, and it's so interesting that the two leads won an Oscar in the same year. You but, mean last year's Savage Grace reunion show? Yes, right. right. But I would love to know what you had to go through in order to simply make a film about such a touching subject. You know, we, we optioned Savage Grace literally like, you know, the year, the year after Swoon was made, which was a different cultural time. So we actually thought we'd be able to get it made. And um, it went through a lot of iterations, a lot of, a lot of the script went through a lot of different versions. Um, and it took, I think, a good like 12 years to get to the screen. Um, you know, I was finishing, God, I was finishing, uh, I think, Far From Heaven. I was finishing Far From Heaven with Julianne, and I said, I've got a script for you. And I, and I was like, it's really tough, but you're gonna love it. And she was about to go on vacation after Far From Heaven to, you know, because it had been a, a long shoot, and she came back and she was like, fuck you, I do love it, you know? Like, you were right, it's, but boy, this is tough, but I have to play this. So I give a lot of credit to Julie, she stuck with it, and we um, somehow, you know, somehow, it was one of those, sometimes with, with getting a movie greenlit, you feel like it couldn't have happened the day before, it couldn't have happened the next day, but somehow, the stars aligned, somebody was, you know, ate their oatmeal that, that morning or had too many cups of coffee or somehow 
it all just lines up, and it was sort of like that. We had to make it at um, a much reduced budget than we, than we had originally intended, but that made Tom and Howard Rodman, the, the screenwriter, you know, it kind of forced them to interrogate the script at every level, like every scene, you know, uh, and I feel like it made for a stronger film ultimately. I mean, you know, we always say that to be a little bit of a Pollyanna. It was good that we lost half our budget, but it is, I think, in, in Savage Grace's case. And then, of course, you know, the wonderful discovery of Eddie Redmayne, who, you know, lobbied like crazy to play that part. You know, and the first thing he always says to me whenever I see him at, you know, these glittering awards lunches I, and, and dinners I get to go to is how's Tom and when can we work together again? So, you know, it's, uh, he considers it one of the greatest creative experiences of his career, which is also really saying something. Let's see if he wins an Oscar for the Danish girl. No, he has. No, he will. Maybe win another one in a row. He was. What was it last year? Everyone Steve knows Hawkins. it's Leo's year. Oh yeah, true. It's Leo's year. <laughs> now we're getting into. Haven't you been reading the tablet? <laughs> He was not queer enough, so ending with that, maybe we, you can just, uh, continue the conversation tomorrow at 11.30. There is a Berlinale talent, sort of like an experimental panel, that's a new form. Christine Vachon is on it, Bruce La Bruce is on it, Handel Klaus is on it, the director of Tomcat Carter, then a fantastic new filmmaker called Aquaza Adoma Owos, who made a film called Reluctantly Queer, that's in the shorts competition, and also Swedish filmmaker um, Sarah your dinner, um, who made this kicky sort of like, um, not a reboot, but sort of like update of Jenny Livingston's Paris is Burning. They're all going to be there in a room, not in a panel situation like this, but amongst others. Come join and discuss. Then tomorrow night at 8, Kino International is one of the rare screenings of the wonderful Hedwig and the Angry Inch. And then also there's the chance to see the one film that um, Christine produced this year, Goat. That's tonight. That's tonight, and then there are repetition screenings, I think. But I want to ask, uh, I want to thank you very much for coming, asking questions, being so patient, and thank you so much for coming. Christine Lachon.